Educators Lead, Episode 134. Simple is better than complex. Whatever the task at hand is, whatever the lesson is that you're teaching in the on the athletic field or in the classroom, do your best to to boil it down to as simple simple concepts and language as you can. It, it might be a complex uh, skill you're trying to teach, but make it as simple as you can to be effective. Welcome to Educators Lead, where we interview leaders in education to offer inspiration and practical advice to help launch educators into the next level of leadership. I'm your host, Jay Willis, and I want to thank you for subscribing to our show. This is John Lee Dumas of EO Fire, and you're listening to Educators Lead. Let's join my friend Jay Willis and get ready to take your leadership to the next level. Hello, Edge Leaders. Jay Willis here, and I'm excited to introduce our featured guest today, Chris Trieste. Chris, are you ready? Yeah. Hi, Jay. How are you? I am ready and I'm excited and enthused and uh, looking forward to the, to the interview. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, Chris Trieste has over 20 years of experience in K-12 through education as a teacher, school administrator, athletic director, and coordinator of physical education. Over the past 10 years, Chris has coached many different sports from elementary through high school. He has extensive experience in tennis, serving as the head men's tennis coach at Mount St. Mary College, where he was named Coach of the Year twice and led that team to its first conference championship in program history. Chris currently lives in Hudson Valley, New York, with his wife and three kids and serves as a district coordinator of physical education and health at White Plains City School District. Chris is also the author of his latest and only book, 14 Great Coaches, Learn Their Lessons, Improve Your Coaching, and Have a Lasting Impact. So that's just a brief introduction, Chris, but tell us a little bit more about yourself. I grew up and went to college in New York. I was out on the West Coast for several years. Um, so I taught out there, middle education, came back to New York and continued with my career as a physical education teacher and a health teacher. And then after several years in, in that role or in those roles, I made the leap into school leadership. My first role in, uh, as a school leader was an assistant principal at the elementary school level. Really enjoyed it, had a good time with it. It was a K through five school, worked with a lot of, uh, a lot of really great people, a lot of great students, uh, found the, the role both rewarding and challenging. But at some point, uh, I kind of made the decision to kind of make a transition into uh, becoming an athletic director. I changed uh, districts and changed positions. I pursued an athletic director role where I felt I could be a uh, school leader and use that those kind of experiences that I, I had gained and was learning about and apply it to really an area that I felt uh, most comfortable with and my greatest interest and, and I guess greatest expertise. So I was in the athletic director world and I was a director of physical education in that position as well, uh, district-wide director of physical education and uh, high school athletic director. And then I uh, did that for several years. And now in my current position, I'm in a large city school district as the K through 12 coordinator of physical education and health. And, uh, Roughly uh, a little more than 30 teachers and nine schools within the district that, that are kind of under my supervision and uh, all various administrative and leadership type tasks, curriculum, instruction, budgeting, hiring, mentoring, and, and you know, and more. But that all kind of uh, falls under my responsibility with regard to physical education and health. And then kind of as a parallel career, I, I did quite a bit of coaching through the years. I was, as you mentioned, the uh, men's tennis coach at Mount St. Mary College, a Division Three liberal arts college in the Hudson Valley here in New York. I did that for six years. Uh, we had some ups and downs, but we had a number of very successful years during that time period. I enjoyed that quite a bit. But I was doing, I had a lot of uh, uh, plates I was kind of spinning at once, and I had something had to go. So I, I had a focus on my uh, school leadership and school administration, my full-time career. And then also my kids were at the age where I was getting involved with their youth sports. And uh, uh, in some 
cases as a coach and other cases just as an as a parent and a spectator. But I've done that for approximately 10 years. Um, so that that's that's kind of, you know, a little bit of a synopsis. And as you mentioned, just this year, I have had a book published. It's titled 14 Great Coaches, Learn Their Lessons, Improve Your Coaching, Have a Lasting Impact. And it was based on the research of uh, 14 renowned, uh, famous, very successful coaches and some of their practices and insights that I felt really translated um, throughout the sports world or the athletic world, but not not just those uh, settings, but also in uh, academics and education and, and even in business and, and their principles that I, I like to say are timeless and uh, uh, apply in, in almost any setting. Right. So that's uh, that's kind of where I'm at right now. I have uh, I am married. I have three children. And one's in college, and I have uh, boy girl twins. They're seniors in high school. So um, so that's kind of where I'm at. Yeah. Well, so I want to jump in here in a minute and talk about you know your more about your journey and also about the book that you've written. Uh, but before I jump into that, what would maybe be something interesting about yourself that? Well. Uh, you know what, I guess I would say interesting, huh? Well, one of the things I have done is I have had the opportunity to, uh, as I mentioned briefly, uh, though I was born in, born in New York and, and did all my K through 12 and college schooling in New York, I did live in California, went all the way to the other side of the United States for three years to California. Uh, had a wonderful experience out there, uh, worked in a, in a city, uh, uh, called Torrance, Torrance, California, for the public school system there. And it was a great, great experience. And for me, uh, you know, I, I would say in the areas I lived lived in New York prior to that were, were moderately diverse. But when I went out to Southern California, to suburban Los Angeles, that district was about as diverse as you can get. And I remember the the uh, the some of the literature that the district provided, that there were over 150 languages home wow. languages spoken, you know, different languages that were spoken at ho- the homes of the students in the district. So it was, uh, it was just a great, great experience to me. Uh, I grew so much being out there. Um, I was able to kind of use some of the lessons I learned and kind of just broaden my horizons. And when I came back to New York, it made me a better teacher and a better person. And, uh, again, just opened my, up my eyes in so many different ways. So it was an experience. So I guess a, a lesson there is that I, I would encourage anyone, you know, at some point in their careers, uh, early on maybe, that might be the best time, but um, just take some kind of a chance or a risk. And, and if you could see another part of the country or the world, I guess, uh, for an extended, extended period of time, it would be, uh, you know, just so beneficial. In what ways do you feel like that experience impacted you? Uh yeah, it, it just just the different ways to communicate, and you know there were so many different students from so many different places and the different languages that they spoke. That that even somebody with a uh, an incredible education and, and incredible knowledge, you know, would still have to improvise and find ways to to relate to and to communicate with people from other countries. And and like you know, for example, if you speak of Latin America, um, well, yeah, that that in a lot of parts of our country, that may mean uh, Mexico or, or Puerto Rico or the Dominican. But, but in this part of the country, it, it meant so many different con- countries within that area or Asia. You talk about Asia and people from Asia, you know, in some places somebody might think of, um, you know, or relate to students or have contact with students from China. But again, within, within Asia it can mean dozens of countries. And that was kind of what I felt like I was exposed to just people from so many different places and different perspectives and different life experiences um, so it just took me a little while, but to just find ways, somewhat times simple ways, hand, communication, hand, hand communication, gestures, pictures, just different ways to try to make some kind of connection. So that, that was really cool. Hmm. You know, I don't know if you found this uh, is it's one thing that I found just from traveling and going to different parts of the world is I, I've, I've been struck by how similar we kind of all are as people, like how you can connect with anybody from any country, even if you don't even speak their language and how like the smile is like something that you, everybody knows what that means, regardless of, you know, where you're at or what language you speak. It's kind of like they're universal things that we all kind of share in common. It's really kind of interesting. It really is. 
I, I do agree with that, and especially when you're first meeting someone, you know, they, people, regardless of background and, and language, they can kind of pick up on a warm gesture and a welcoming gesture, that's for sure. Yeah. Well, so I want to dive in and talk more about your journey to where you are now in a minute. But before we go there, I'd like to hear more about your book, uh, 14 Great Coaches, Learn Their Lessons, Improve Your Coaching, Have a Lasting Impact. So what what is the journey? What did that the journey to you writing that book look like? And then what's the book all about? So that that's great. I'm glad you asked that question, Jay. Um, the journey has, uh, I guess, it has taken quite a while. I, I for many, many years, I, I kind of thought or I kind of knew maybe that or hoped there was a book that I would write. And, and I kind of had some ideas and it, it evolved in a number of different ways. But I knew it was going to be somewhere in the in the world of effective teaching, effective coaching, and have a kind of a positive, positive leadership and positive coaching thread to it. So, so I had these concepts as I was, as I was, as an athletic director, as a teacher, like, like I would kind of look at some of the people who really connected and built good relationships and, and, um, you know, the best, the good teachers that I was exposed to and the good coaches that I was exposed to and kind of see what they were doing. And I, I would kind of write some stuff down and, and make some observations. And, and then as a hobby of mine, I would read read all different biographies about about great coaches. You know, for example, Vince Lombardi or 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 Joe Madden or John Wooden or Joe Torre, and and I started seeing some things in common, and uh, so it kind of developed in that way. And then, but I still had so I had kind of a framework and an idea, but it was only until the last several months that I really kind of figured it out. So, so the book is, uh, there are 14 coaches. Now, some people will say, are they the 14 greatest coaches? Or they'll look at the list and they'll say, but so-and-so is not in there. And, and I'll say, yes, the, the title is not the 14 greatest coaches. It's, it's 14 great coaches because there's any number of great, greatest coaches or great coaches, right? You could go on. It could, the, the 14 is a little bit arbitrary. It could have been 15. It could have been 20. It could have been 40. But I just wanted a little bit of a cross-section uh, of coaches from, that are current, from a generation or two, from a variety of different sports, from high school, from college, from professional. So I want kind of a cross section of that. And then then the principles and the observations that I made over the years, I kind of shaped them and matched them up with a lot of the principles and concepts and insights from these great coaches. So so there are 14 coaches featured, there are 60 lessons or concepts or insights. Um, and, and that's what it is. And like I said, a lot of it, so it'll apply to basketball or baseball or tennis or golf or track and field. And, and the lessons are pulled from coaches who were high achievers anywhere from high school to the professional. But in some cases, maybe you need to make some modifications, but these apply throughout all those levels of play and, and, and below and, and youth level and recreational level. And not only that, many of them are human relationship concepts. So they apply to the classroom and they apply to educational leadership. So, um, you know, to me, it's very exciting. I've gotten positive feedback about it. It is the title and the main focus is more of an athletic um, type of a theme. But again, there, there are certainly many of the concepts will fit in anywhere and for anyone who's looking to make better connections. Right. I, I find that, you know, for most of the listeners, they are primarily uh, educators, you know, educational leaders. And uh, I feel like, you know, there's so much that you can take from coaching that really applies in the classroom. And when you're trying to, you know, when you're trying to teach students. Yeah, correct, Jay. So, I, so I'll, I'll give you an example. So there's one of the principles in the book is titled the carrot is better than the stick. And that that I kind of drew from from John Wooden, a championship basketball coach for UCLA in the 50s, 60s, 70s. And, and in essence, what that, that concept is, is that, that John Wooden preferred to find positive methods to motivate. So he wouldn't berate, he wouldn't humiliate, he wouldn't insult. Um, you know, he'd try to appeal to the person's sense of pride and the person's, you know, hopefully the person's desire to excel. So he would try to find ways in a more positive way, a, you know, kind of a carrot or reward type of a way to, to motivate, to bring out the best in people as opposed to punishments or, or negative strategies. Well, so I guess, uh, you know, if, if somebody bought this book and they sat down and read the whole thing, 
what would you want them to walk away with after they finish the book? I would hope that they would walk away with some very practical, um, useful ideas and thoughts on how to, uh, yes, to, to improve performance, teacher, teacher performance, improve student learning, improve, uh, find ways to, to build relationships and make better connections and uh, just bring out the best, help people to reach their potential. Uh, again, whether it's a classroom or an athletic field or, or any other endeavor. Yeah. And they can cite, and what they can do is they could cite these um, highly successful, highly acclaimed uh, coaches, championship coaches. So it's not something that, it's not even something that me, I made up, or it's not something that the reader is making up. Mike Krzyzewski, uh, championship coach of Duke basketball, or for Pat Summit, who won NCAA championships and, and won more basketball games than any uh, female college basketball coach ever, uh, you know, and so on and so forth. There, there are other examples, but that's what it is. This is coming from experts who have who've accomplishments or are second to none. And just with some maybe modification or some adaptations, they can apply and, and, you know, be brought down to any level. Mm. So I know that when you, you know, you have this big undertaking writing a book, it's, it's kind of a journey for yourself as well, like a personal journey. In what ways do you feel like, in what ways did writing this book impact you personally? Like what were some of your greatest takeaways from it? Well, you know, when you when you're researching and you're writing and you're espousing a certain way of thinking um, and certain methods and ideas, you do sometimes pause and and check your own progress, right? So I, uh, there are times I look at some of the things uh, and say, okay, I got to make sure I'm really doing this. Or there are times I'm doing this, but there have been times in the past maybe I didn't do this quite the way I should have. So it's a way of growing and reflecting and thinking about. Uh, your own methods. And that's kind of what I did. And I think, you know, I would like to think that right now I am a much better coach than I was 10 or 15 years ago. And it has nothing to do with wins or losses, but it just has to do with building relationships and, and helping people. And, and like the title says, have a lasting impact, have an enduring impact. So, so when the season's over or several seasons are over and you get new players People come and go, but they can reflect back and what was their experience like with you as a coach? Hmm. Or let's bring it to the classroom. What was this student? What is the student going to say three years from now, five years from now, when they reflect on their experience that they had with you as a teacher? Um, so, so that's that's certainly a takeaway there, and it's it's again, it's a certainly something that forced me to reflect and think very closely on my own actions because I I do feel like I was following these uh, concepts and insights, but but just like anyone else, I make mistakes and I, I mess up and it's a way to just kind of gauge where you are and where you want to be and where you should be. Yeah. Well, so, you know, give us maybe kind of a sneak peek into the book. What, what would you say is the key or like one of the keys to having a lasting impact? I certainly would say one of them is, is trust, building trust and, um, that, you know, you do certain things like you, you under promise, you don't over promise, you under promise and over deliver. That's one of those sayings. Um, I do have a section in there about being very careful with making promises and, and in the classroom and on the athletic field, it's, it's kids take things very literally. So if you say you're going to do something or you even infer it, um, you know, and it can't happen, it doesn't happen. Maybe circumstances changed. Uh, that, that's a tough one. So just be careful with how you phrase your words and what you say and, and, you know, make sure you're very clear. My hope is to blank, or if this happens, then we will be able to do this. So as opposed to, to making promises, uh, that's, that's one way to build trust. Uh, another way to build trust is to kind of share stories of your own, uh, successes and failures. So it helps you to, uh, relate to players or students and vice versa. So they can see, Hey, yeah, this guy or this gal sitting in front of the room or, or with the whistle around their neck in charge. Uh, yeah, they had, they had, wow, I can understand that. They understand where I'm coming from. They had some of the same frustrations I'm having, you know, that that's another way uh, to build trust. So I think also what trust does is once you build up relationships and there's a level, a layer of trust there, when you do have to maybe be a bit of a taskmaster or, um, you know, maybe speak in a little tougher terms at times or, or maybe put a, a stronger push 
you can do it because you've built some trust and you've built a uh, you know, relationship and, and the students or the athletes, whoever the case may be, know that you care. So that, that's, that's trust is a very big part of it. I think, um, I did allude to it too, as I was, I was speaking just now, but also putting yourself in their shoes. That's another part. I think that's important to help people to, uh, uh, to help have a, a, an enduring positive impact. So again, it's not, it's not, it's easy to stand in front sometimes, um, and forget what it was like to struggle or, or what you may think is very simple. It, it may not be. And, and you may have been in that same position years ago. Uh, so, so don't, don't forget that. And then finally, have fun. Have some fun. There's a lot to accomplish and a lot to do. And, and every single moment is not fun. But um, you have to have, you have to throw in there maybe some appropriate humor or, or throw at the plan every once in a while and, and, and mix it up. Or, or let your players or your athletes, your, your students have some choice in what's going to be done you know, periodically. And just, just loosen things up every once in a while. Well, it sounds like a great book and I'll make sure to put links for people to be able to find it in the show notes uh, for this. So it is called 14 Great Coaches, Learn Their Lessons, Improve Your Coaching, Have a Lasting Impact. So jumping back into your journey, your own personal journey, at what point along the way did you make the decision to go into education? You know, uh, to become a teacher, you know, my undergraduate major was communication. So so that wasn't my initial um, part of my initial thought process. But what I did over the summer was I, I taught tennis quite a bit and then I worked in summer camps. And, um, so I had some experience working with young people and doing things that are similar to teaching. And I had, and then I had, uh, when I was doing the tennis camp specifically at those, that was late afternoon at night. And at night I had teachers, adults, uh, teachers who were, I was teaching tennis to, and they kind of took a liking to my methods and the way I was doing things. And they kind of encouraged me to take a look at, at this profession a little closer. And then fast forward two or three years later, that, that is what I did. I, I had to go back to school. I got my teaching certification and a master's degree and, um, and pursued a career in teaching. And, and I guess somewhere, even when, when I was an undergrad and I didn't major in, in physical education or, or in any education for that matter, any, any educational teaching uh, discipline, I, I did have probably somewhere in the back of my mind the idea that I might go in this direction or I might be a coach or, or something in that kind of realm. So I think it was probably in my head, in the back of my head before it became kind of something on the forefront there. So, so that, that, was my, that was my beginning. Uh, and it was funny. My, I was out in California at the time. That's where I got my teaching credential and that's where I went back to school. And it was just a good, it was a good timing. I interviewed with, with really no, um, no K-12 direct experience. And uh, it was good timing. They were lowering class sizes and they were, it, it was something with the contract and, and giving the teachers an additional prep period or something like that. So we we're hiring physical education, music, and our teachers. And so my a lot of the timing uh, worked out to at least get me started. So I guess... At what point in your journey did you kind of make the decision to move from the classroom to becoming a school administrator? Like, was there kind of, well, you know, I guess was it, was there kind of a specific point in time where you made that decision or a specific event, or was it just kind of a gradual decision? I don't think there was a, a specific an aha moment uh, or one one kind of uh, episode or or happening. That, that took me in that direction. I, I think I had in the back of my head that I was going to do that. And, um, you know, to me, I, I, I really enjoyed teaching and being right on the front line, so to speak. But I also thought that long term, long term, I knew if I pursued the administrative certification, I'd have maybe more career options uh, as the years progressed. And I also felt that I could see things from a little bit of a bigger picture. And, and that was the case. So that, that was my motivation primarily. And maybe have, hopefully, have a larger impact. So if you're, you're in your classroom, you're, or in, the, in your physical education class in the gym, you're impacting X amount of people, X amount of students. But if you take the administrative route, you potentially can have a positive impact on, on many more people. And so, so instead of your own class, maybe 
10 teachers classrooms or 20 teachers or, you know, so on and so forth. So that was kind of um, what I was thinking at the time. Uh, it would give me more possibilities for, for a long-term career and also have hopefully a bigger and a positive impact. Yeah. So what was, what would you say was the most difficult part of the journey to becoming a school administrator? So after finishing the degree and going on a number of interviews and getting my first position as an assistant principal at the elementary level, um, it, it, it struck me quickly. Like there, so I taught physical education and health and I had, I had some knowledge of other discipline areas and some, some knowledge of how our school building works, but just very, very basic knowledge. So now all of a sudden there were all different, uh, academic areas and all different concerns and all different angles that people coming to me with. And, 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 you know, I don't think it's unusual because everyone who becomes an administrator who was a teacher previously, like no one has taught every subject and no one has taught every grade level. Right. So it's, it's, but there are a lot, there's a lot of new things coming at you and people looking at you for an answer sometimes quickly. So, so there's a bit of an adjustment there. And, um, you kind of learn a little bit, you, like you kind of have developed some cheat sheets to help you and see so some main ideas and some important concepts that you have at your fingertips. Um, also, you can learn, you learn at some point that you don't have to be, you don't have to have all the answers. You certainly don't have to have all the answers at the moment you're being asked <laughs> questions. So you can say, let me look into that and get back to you. Or you can rely on the expertise of, of other people. And, and sometimes it's, it's what they're looking for is making you to make provide some leadership or make a sound decision, but so you have to gather the information and and think things through. But you don't necessarily have to be that expert on every single thing that you encounter. Right. Well, that's hard too because a lot of times when they come to you with a problem, they just want an instant solution. <laughs> like, and I know early in my leadership journey, I was tempted to give a real fast solution to whatever problem that people presented me with. But I find that the wiser approach is to really, like you said, collect all the information and make sure that you really understand the situation before offering advice. Yeah, absolutely. And I totally agree, Jay. I, I was guilty of that too. You think that you're on the spot to come up with something and uh, come up with it quickly. And that's that's not the case. That's not the best way to do things. Um, and if you fake it a little too much, people will know anyway. <laughs> so it's better to, to yeah, gather information, um, consider different options and their consequences and sometimes, yeah, sometimes rely on other people who have more experience or more knowledge and then make the best decision you can. But that was a lesson. Absolutely. Because I, I was in that spot, too. And I remember that, too. Just thinking, oh, I have to have an answer on my fingertips. But you don't. Yeah. And it's a hard lesson to learn sometimes. And usually it comes from when you make a decision quickly based on just a little bit of information. And then later you realize it was a bad decision once you get all the rest of the facts. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Those are learned yes. the hard way. The only time is that, you know, you may need to make a quick decision, instant decision. If it's a matter of people's safety, then, then you have to be able to think clearly right. and uh, process information quickly and effectively. And they, that's a little different story. But if it's, you know, if it's other than that, you're trying to solve problems or, or, or provide a direction you, you can have, you usually have more time than you think. And, right. and you, yeah, you got to get it right. Don't rush it. Yeah. Well, so you've been in teaching and administration for a while. I'm sure you have some amazing stories to share of the impact that you've been able to witness and to be a part of, but what would you say has been like one of your best moments as a, either as a coach, as a teacher, or as an administrator? Yeah, I can give you, I can give you a couple that come to mind, you know, and, and I think that through the years as, as an assistant principal there, especially, but as an athletic director too, there've been a number of challenging situations that I've been a part of either. I, I was the leader or I was one of the leaders and uh, you know, a number of student issues or parent teacher conflicts. Uh, I've been a part of a couple of uh, lockdowns, like real things, not, not drills, not lockdown drills. Um, you know, there's one without getting into too much of the detail, but as an assistant principal, there was one incident where the principal was not, she was at, she was unavailable. Either she was out sick or she was away to conference. I don't remember, but it was a, we were given a court order um, in a custody battle, mm. at effect of twelve noon. So we're in the middle of school, and there's a mother who comes in with this court order that she has to give up custody to a father who lives in another state, and he was going to be there at twelve noon, expecting this transfer of the student. 
and it was probably about 11.45 a.m. <laughs> when mm. we got this. So I had to think quickly, keep people safe. Um, there were a lot of things going on there. I had, I had to try to determine if this court order was even accurate, if it was even real. Mm. Um, so to try to keep the story very kind of concise, I was able to, I did have a social worker in the building and a psychologist and the police department was, was literally uh, across the street, about 30 steps um, across the street. And we had a great relationship. Uh, I was able to have the secretary help uh, by sending a fax to this district office. I was able to get on the phone with the, with the help of the support people that I, that I mentioned, um, you know, did, did, was able, was told that the, yeah, this is legitimate. This has to happen in this, in this office and at 12 o'clock. And so I'm thinking, how do I keep the office? How do I isolate this? So it doesn't disrupt the office. How do I, uh, do we call some kind of lockdown or, or some kind of, um, you know, restrict parts of the building. So I had to make a lot of decisions in a short amount of time, uh, keeping the safety of the people involved, you know, paramount and follow the law mm. <laughs> and do this in a short amount of time. So, so the end, the end of the story is yes, that the child, the mother had to physically give this seven year old up to the father mm. and with the help of the police and with the help of the school psychologist and the social worker, it, it it, it went about peacefully and as seamlessly as it could, but there was a lot going on there in a short amount of time. And um, so when I think about what did I want to accomplish here, I wanted everyone to be safe. I wanted to minimal disruption of the building. I want to make sure we were following whatever district and legal procedures we had to follow. And, um, and we did do that. So, so in a lot of ways, I was happy with how it ended, um, and it was a very tense, uh, intense and tense situation that could have gone wrong in any number of ways. Mm. So that, you know, that Jay, so we talk about different curriculum or having to know about all different subject matter, but, but that was a case of just making a smart decision, or I guess it was a smart decision, an effective decision and, and weighing different potential outcomes. And it really had nothing to do with math or science or English or phys ed. Mm. Yeah. What do you think helped prepare you for that moment? Because obviously you feel as though you dealt with it well. And, you know, we have so much classroom training for how to educate students, but what prepares you for that moment when something like that happens? I think uh, one, one of the things, Jay, I think we had at that point a number of dish, different issues um beforehand nothing quite like that but other times uh like i like i, I remember I, that we had a lockdown or two before that and we had we had a two or three issues that were kind of uh yeah required kind of quick level-headed decisions and in those other instances the principal was there and i was the assistant principal and at times we got some advice from district office so we had things on a on a much much lower scale happened that, but that did require some kind of, uh, uh, level headed thinking. So, so I think that was good preparation, um, in hindsight. And, but then it also one, one of the pieces of advice I, I had received, and I don't even remember where exactly I received this. Or I may have, may have read it, but, and I think that is something I've tried to remember is when other people are getting very excited or very emotional or seem to be losing control, you know, the leader has got to try to maintain their composure and, and maintain their ability to make, make a sound decision. So I, I think that's always been something I've tried to remember. So a combination of some smaller kind of, uh, so to speak, high pressure events and plus that kind of mindset, I think combined helped me quite a bit there. Right. Okay. Yeah. So I guess, uh, you know, you had mentioned two, you had two stories, I think. Did you say you had two stories? Yeah, that, yeah. Then, I, then I can go back to when I was an athletic director, and there, there was an issue there where we, um, it was a tough situation. There was an employee who was suspended, and and it was a very polarizing figure. Half of the community was was kind of got behind this person, and and the, the other half was totally against this person, and it it really divided the district. And, and again, there was some people taking sides and it was just not, and, and the local newspaper was, you know, having a good time putting these different articles in there that were, you know, again, would, would polarize the community. 
And um, that was kind of at the end of the spring, beginning of the summer that happened. And, and we came back in the fall. And the uh, district, again, it was kind of a tough time. And this is where athletics, this is where I think athletics is an example of where they can unite and uh, be a positive influence and transcend sports. Can The lessons from sports and the accomplishments from sports can transcend just the, the athletic field. Um, to make a long story short, the, uh, the football team, which was always a good team, ended up making it to the state championship game. Mm. And now you could see it progress. It was great. And one of our players was, was just phenomenal, was uh, broke a couple of state records. And you could, I could see it as it was happening, especially in hindsight, I can see it. But the newspaper coverage was no longer about this polarizing figure. It was all about this excitement in town and, and the winning football team and how the community, the, the local uh, independent stores and even, even the chain stores that were not too far away were, were donating money. So when we wanted a fan bus, you know, they were kind of helping us fund some of the, the extras that come along with winning week after week after week and mm. the season extending three, four years, uh, three or four weeks longer than maybe you anticipate. So it really, and then most, right, two thirds away from the, from the, uh, through the season, that, that story, that controversial story from the spring was seemed like ancient history. And that person ended up moving on anyway, but it just, the whole, if you picked up a newspaper or you walked through the community in May, you would have gotten one vibe. And then if you walk down those same streets or talk to the same people in late October, you would have gotten a totally different, uh, 180 degree different vibe. Mm. And, um, you know, that's not an accomplishment of mine. I wasn't playing or coaching, but, um, it was just an experience that, that I thought was very exciting and just transformed the, uh, the culture of the, uh, of the school in, in, in a relatively short amount of time. Mm. Wow. Yeah, that's, it's neat that something so positive could kind of uh, dwarf something negative that was going on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and all the people who seem to be, um, not literally, figuratively at their, th- at each other's throats were, <laughs> you would never have known, you, you know, they were all, they're piling around and, uh, carpooling together and going to barbecues together. Yeah. Cheering for the same team, right? Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Well, so one more question. It's kind of related to this. Before I jump into uh, a few rapid fire questions, how how do you feel like lessons that learned in coaching, uh, coaching sports, how does that translate over to the academic world in the classroom? Well, uh, you know, best way for me to explain that is, uh, you know, I'll give you another example from my book. There's uh, something while I was researching uh, called the positivity ratio, and it's something that that their coaches. Um, who try to adhere to this and the, the research has been done that the highest performing teams and highest, uh, best, uh, most effective or, or highest performing relationships, I guess you could say, um, occur when the positive to negative, positive to negative comments or interactions, the positive net to negative ratio is five to one. Mm. So, and that, that's a hard thing to accomplish if you really think about it. Um, especially when you're thinking of maybe somebody who's described as old school, whether it's a coach or a teacher, a lot of times, you know, that real taskmaster has an old world view of things and it's, it's a lot of negative and, and kind of harping on things and, and, you know, that type of thing. But, but the research also says that eh, an okay performing team is three to one. Um, and then the, the worst teams it's, it's reversed. The negative to positive is, is, is like two to one. So, Let's think about that. So if you want people to to perform their best on a playing field or you want people to believe in themselves or or be optimistic or to have a growth mindset, um, all of these those things are cultivated through a positive to negative uh, ratio that is is close to five to one. So and that that again, it, that's in the math class, that's in an art class, it's in physical education, it's on the football. It's on the baseball field. Um, it could be in a, in a small business. So what I would encourage you know, teachers, coaches, leaders to do is to monitor that. Just, just try to randomly and without, without uh, purposely skewing your um, – try to keep it authentic uh, and just kind of see where you are. Are you at three to one? Are you at one to one? Are you at five to one? And um, so that's, that's an example from the book and that's an example from my research that, again, I could see – on the field and in the classroom. And, um, and by the way, it's interesting what I read too, what research shows that there is, there is, there is something such as too positive. So an excess excessiveness of positive. So for example, if there's a if your ratio is 12 to one or 15 to one, it may just be a sign that you're not 
uh, confronting some difficult situations. Mm. You know, we're not, not, you know, trying to not addressing things that might not be as pleasant. So, you know, that, that's a great, uh, concept that I enjoy telling people about. And, and that's another one that too, I have to check my own progress on that too. Yeah. Just as you were saying that I was thinking about, boy, this applies to parenting too. And you know, oh how, <laughs> yeah. How often do I actually, you know, carry that ratio uh, with my kids? Exactly. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a tough one. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if it's five to one. It probably isn't. <laughs> Another one, I'll, you know, another one, Jay, I'll, I'm just going to jump in on here. So Bill Walsh, the uh, coach, Hall of Fame coach, yeah. former coach of the 49ers, NFL football coach, and uh, John Wooden, his name comes up a lot in some of the research I did in positive leadership and positive coaching. Uh, Vince Lombardi, too, all were proponents of simple is better than complex. Mm. So whatever the task at hand is, whatever the lesson is that you're teaching in the on the athletic field or in the classroom, do your best to to uh, to boil it down to as simple simple concepts and language as you can. It, it might be a complex or multi-step or very difficult um, uh, skill you're trying to teach or concept you're trying to teach, but make it as simple as you can to be uh, effective. Right? Don't don't make it excessively difficult just for, for who knows what reason, but, you know, use as simple language as you can, uh, use diagrams or pictures or speak in language that, that can, uh, resonate with your students or your athletes. So, so whatever it is, again, it doesn't mean what you're teaching is simple, but whatever it is, make it as simple as you can. Right. Yeah, boy, that's great. Uh, so the, uh, I'm going to roll through some rapid fire questions. If you have a couple minutes for those. Absolutely. Okay. So first off, what would you say is the best leadership advice you've ever received? One, uh, one that I like is, um, you know, worry about or focus on what you can control. And that's, uh, that's a pretty simple piece of advice. And, and sometimes it's tough to do. Like, like it's easy to get uh, worried about all sorts of what ifs, but let's focus on what we can control and let's, let's do our best with what we can control. Right. Well, so what would you say is your biggest strength as a leader? Uh, I would think that it would, you know, I've been told and and I do, I do think I see this as it's, I do have a kind of a sequential and logical way of thinking. So I, I think that I am able to process and absorb information and then, you know, pretty clearly look at what the possible outcomes are or possible consequences are. So um, maybe kind of a level headed, um, level headed, uh, thought process. And like I said, kind of a sequential logical way of thinking. So do you have a book or two maybe that you would recommend that have made a big impact on you? Yeah, there, there are three books that come to mind. Um, one is, uh, a, a book by an educator, very uh, kind of a well-known educator, and he speaks quite a bit too, uh, by Todd Whitaker, and it's t- titled "What Great Teachers Do Differently." Uh, he also has a book, "What Great Principals Do Differently," and they're they're similar. One is obviously more geared to teaching, the other one to school administration, but they're kind of simple and logical, um, common sense. Although common sense is not that common, but but just different pieces of advice, and they're they're kind of you know, there's a humor type of an element to some of the stories too. So I found that very helpful as both in my role as a teacher and as a school leader. Uh, that is one. And another one is, is, uh, a John Wooden book, coach Wooden's leadership game plan for success. And that's, that's another one I think again, pretty concise in a lot of ways. And when you think about it, you're like, Oh yeah, of course. But, uh, when you're in, in the trenches there, <laughs> it's not so easy to think of some common sense or, or some lessons that, uh, Oh yeah, of course. Those type of lessons are not always right there (laughs) at the moment, but those are two good books I really like. And I refer to them a lot. Yeah. Well, so, uh, yeah, that's one of the things I love about coaches. Most of the time is they're just really concise to the point. No, no beating around the bush. Like, here's what you need to do. I mean, obviously with, with some uh, tact, but at the same time, like it's just, it's kind of refreshing sometimes for people to just kind of tell you what's really on their mind. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Well, so what advice would you have for a teacher or a school leader regarding working with their students? Yeah, it goes back, I think, to some of the things I was saying before. Uh, try to 
remember what it was like to be a student and put yourself in their shoes. I, I just think that's very important because, um, you know, when you're a teacher or a coach, you've accomplished, uh, you've reached some level of mastery and, and um, expertise. And uh, the people you're teaching and coaching don't have that. They're not at that level. So it, it's something just to keep in mind, I think. Just kind of keep that at your fingertips really every day. You know, it, do, it doesn't mean sometimes there aren't, uh, you know, the, the athletes or, co- or students, you know, they're not focused or they're not thinking clearly or they're not paying attention. I mean, all those things happen and you have to address those. But just sometimes – just keep in mind, you know, uh, what was it like when I was that age? Um, or what was it like? Um, what if I was in their shoes? You know, how would I feel if a teacher or a coach was talking to me like this? Right. Yeah. Or even what's going on in their home life, right? Like, and how, how might that yeah. be affecting them? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You never, you don't know, you don't know. And, um, yeah, we talk about that in, lot in the district I work in and it's very diverse in many ways. Uh, one of the ways economically. So, so what's taken for granted in some houses or in some people's lives is, is a foreign concept in other people's. Right. Well, and so kind of along those lines, what one piece of advice would you have for a school leader as far as working with the other teachers? I would tell them, you know, one of the things that, that I had said, uh, talk to a teacher I was working with and, um, you know, I would encourage teachers to, to be, to do what they can to be the teacher that they would want their child to have. And, um, I think that's sometimes that makes you think <laughs> very carefully. And I had an administrator say to me once, you know, when you talk to teachers or when you're, 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 you're dealing with certain issues, you can ask the teachers, would this be acceptable for your child? And sometimes that does put things in different light and uh, it makes you think or rethink some of your actions or refine some of your actions. So I, I think in, as a, as a general piece of advice, um, it's a good piece. Mm, yeah. Boy, that's great. Well, so the last question I have, if you had a time machine and you could jump in it and go back to the point in time when you first made the decision to go into education, what advice would you go back and give to that younger version of yourself? Jay, you know, that's, that is, yeah, that is tough. That is tough because, um, you get, uh, with, as you get experience, you gain wisdom and you gain, uh, exposure to all different situations. So, uh, so if I were to transport myself back to 20 years, um, yeah, I'm, I'm much more in tune now to, like we just said, the different circumstances, the variety of circumstances and conditions people live in. Um, don't take for granted that they have a stable home or, or, a, uh, or in a loving home. Don't take that for granted. Um, also try, you know, as a 24-year-old, as a whatever I was my first year, um, you also don't necessarily appreciate people's different people's, maybe, maybe I, I didn't, uh, maybe, or I think it's harder to really appreciate different feelings and different emotions mm. that people have. And you saying, Oh, no, this is no big deal. Or, or what are they worried about? You know, but <laughs> sometimes there really are things to worry about or to be concerned about. So, yeah. you know, those, those kind of thoughts, you know, I, I would think they were on my radar to some extent 20 years ago, but not to the extent they are now. Right. Right. Yeah. That's, I feel like that's something you definitely learn over time is how different we are, like how, how much, how much we have in common, but then also how, you know, being different doesn't make us wrong. Like if we, if someone else gets, you know, emotionally bothered by a simple statement and you're just like, well, what's the big deal? It's really no big deal. What does it make them necessarily wrong because they responded that way? It's just, we're, we're different. We look at, you know, the world through different, uh, through a different perspective. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, you know, another thing that has changed through my mind, you know, one of the things you hear sometimes uh, teachers say, well, well, a student has to understand life's not fair. And <laughs> like I probably said it, I don't think I said it a whole lot, but I'm sure I said it at times during my career. But that's almost become a phrase to excuse bad teaching practices or bad decisions by teachers mm-hmm. or educators or, or, you know, life kids know pretty young life's not fair. So right. we don't have to continue to, to, to do things that are unfair to prove that point. <laughs> <laughs> and let me show you how unfair it can be. Yeah. That's probably not the best approach, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, so finally, if one of our listeners wants to reach out to you after the show, what would be the best way to connect with you? 
So there are a number of ways, uh, Jay. So I do have a website, christriest.com, and I'll spell that. It's C-H-R-I-S, and then the last name, T-R-I-E-S-T-E.com. That's that's one uh, way. I also am on Twitter, and that's at C-Triest. So again, C-T-R-I-E-S-T-E, two, the number two. So that's my Twitter handle. And then if you're interested in the book, that's uh, available on Amazon. If you put in that search engine, 14 great coaches, it will come up. So those are different ways somebody could reach out to me. As far as the Twitter goes, I do uh, tweet out and I do share different types of articles or retweet different types of information uh, that kind of comes along my feed or things that I find all in the area of leadership and coaching and, and positive, positive leadership, positive coaching and best practices and teaching. So that's kind of what I've been doing recently. Great. And I'll make sure to put all that in the show notes so people can, can find it there as well. Educators, this has been a great interview today. For the show notes of today's show and other resources, visit educatorslead.com and type the word Chris into the search tool to find his show notes. Chris, thank you for sharing your journey with us today. Jay, thank you so much. It's been my pleasure. Great talking to you. And that wraps up another episode of Educators Lead. This podcast is brought to you by Mometrics, the number one test preparation company. Mometrics offers study materials for over 1,800 different exams, including the SAT, ACT, GED, end-of-course exams, state standard exams like the STAR, teacher certification exams, advanced placement, CLEP, ASVAB, GRE, and so many more. Mometrics takes the mountains of information students could be tested over for any given exam and boils it all down to just the fluff-free golden nuggets of information that are most likely to be on the exam. They couple that with some great study tips and test-taking strategies to help students maximize their test scores. With their interactive tutorial videos and a layout that makes lesson planning easy, Mometrics study guides, flashcards, and practice questions are a great fit for individual or classroom use. To learn more about our products and our vault of hundreds of free tutorial videos, please visit educatorslead.com forward slash test prep. That's educatorslead.com forward slash test prep. Leaders, thank you for joining us on Educators Lead. Visit us at educatorslead.com for everything we talked about today, free resources, and much, much more. 